everyone out there in Bourbon Real Talk land, Randy Sullivan with a very special episode for you today. And I have my special guest with me. He is a repeat offender on Bourbon Real Talk. I have Alex, the man Baptista with us today. I'm so excited to have you on uh, because you are a mad scientist of whiskey and you have come up with a test, a scientific test to figure out what the best port finish whiskey in the United States is. Is that fair? That is. Uh, it is a passion of mine uh, as far since I got into whiskey to try port finish. I feel like it adds a level of depth and complexity to it. Mm -hmm. When you start to get the same five notes out of most bourbons, uh, it gives you something else to kind of look forward to. So I've been, it's been a great opportunity to go out there and say, you know what? There is a lot of great whiskey that's being made in the United States. Very few of it we'll see on the shelves in most markets. Let me go and, and aggregate this and try and find what is the champion port finished American bourbon or whiskey, uh, including rice. Uh, so let's see who we can, how we can do this. And we wanted to take a scientific approach. So I really started this about a year ago in the collection process. And this is only part one of this. And we're going to find out what's the top of part one. But we started with you and I uh, kind of coming up with this idea. Uh, we invited other members of, of Someone Say Whiskey to, to be randomized to join in this because we wanted to get a large sample size audience. So we got five judges uh, and we started with a blind bracket. We did kind of position two of them together in certain areas where you wanted to see a head-to-head -head competition. For example, what's the best Texas bourbon that's been finished in port barrels? Mm -hmm. So we would know right on the first round who, who got that one head-to-head. -head. Uh, we then, over the course of a month, did a sample a day we had a control of a weeded bourbon. It was the same one every single time, whether it be Maker's Mark or Weller, Special Reserve, 15 minutes before. No spicy foods, no uh, awkward flavors, bitters, anything like that. Have the sample, get the control, head to head, write the notes on the first round for some of the tasting profiles. And we did this every single day going through the entire tournament. And man, was I surprised by some of the outcome. I was shocked out of my mind. You all are going to be shocked out of your minds, but on Bourbon Real Talk, we like to drink while we talk. So what, uh, what are we going to drink today? So we're going to do a fresh crack, a per fresh se. A fresh crack, kind of. Okay. Since the topic was port finish, uh, and we know a lot of people are experimenting and we're talking about science. A couple months ago, I decided I want to make my own port finish. Okay. So a lot of people will do poor man's uh, pappy, but there's a new one that's been coming out with poor man's midwinter night's dram, where you take the High West Rendezvous rye, and you add 0.7 ounces of a ruby port to it. Mm -hmm. And that kind of represents the exchange that would come out of a port barrel during the time that these are aged. I couldn't just do it simple. I had to do it big. <laughs> so I decided that instead of calling it poor man's, P-O-O-R, we were gonna change it to P-O-U-R because we are gonna throw in a 40-year Quintana de Carvalho's Tawny from the Douro Valley. Oh, wow. So I haven't even tried this. So okay. hopefully this doesn't taste uh, awkward and terrible. Uh, otherwise my career as a whiskey maker might be short. Oh, well, I'm not worried about that. I, I will say that I've seen some studies where people have, have tried to mimic the, the port barrel finish by putting port in the base whiskey mm -hmm. and then sent those samples out blind. And often the ones that just have some port port in them, yeah. they went out in the, in the blind sample. Uh, right. I mean, you get the raisins all over the nose. Yeah. I also up this one to a full ounce because why, why not? not? Yeah. Let's, yeah. yeah. Let's, let's go big or go home. Ooh. Yeah. It's I'm like, not, I'm not picking up any of the sulfur. So, uh, you know, some of these that we were experimenting with you, you mentioned having a more sulfur flavor to me, it was just a chemically taste, right? Uh, I'm, I'm not getting much of that in this. None. So I'm a sulfur super taster. Okay. Like if, if there is any sulfur in any sort of a finished whiskey, I can smell it. I can taste it. In fact, it's the only thing that I can taste. And if I taste it, I'm done because it's, that's it. That's all I'm getting. And so this was a very interesting exper experiment for me because there's something that happens in these barrels and I've talked with ind industry professionals and they've tried to explain to me 
you know, it, how the barrel is treated from the point that it's dumped before it gets refilled with the whiskey and how much time there is and all of these things can affect mm -hmm. whether or not that, that sulfury flavor comes out. And keep in mind, most finished whiskeys that are, you know, a sherry cask or a port cask, those grapes were likely treated with, one, they have sulfur in them, mm -hmm. right? They have sulfites. Right. But two, they very well may have been treated with sulfites as a preservative between the point that they were picked and they made it to the distillery so that they wouldn't start to rot and ferment and all that stuff before they were supposed to. Absolutely. And you don't really taste that in the wine, but it tends to concentrate itself in the barrel. So some of these had a huge sulfur influence, uh, which was very interesting for me. I was also super shocked at some of the results, right? Because there are some of these that are famous and we know their names and, and they're highly sought after and they trade on the secondary and people really expect that they're gonna be amazing and they're going to love them. And they didn't do as well as you would think. They didn't. And, and I think, you know, to be fair to these subjects, when you're doing a head-to-head -head without a, a, with a single elimination, it can be really tough. Mm -hmm. you, there were some that I noted were super close in another competition, they might have made it a lot further. So sure. obviously five tasters, we've blended the scores together. They advanced, they, they uh, attained higher scores. Um, but there were some shocking numbers. There were only three bottles out of 32 that got no points. Nobody advanced it past the first round. Yeah, and, and, and one of those was one that you would <laughs> you was, would expect would have done better. I was, and I would say, you know, off camera, I'm looking at nine teen bottles of, <laughs> of this, of all the different variations of it. So I would say I am a big fan of it. Uh -huh. And I will still say I'm a big fan of it, but it was really tough position. And it ended up losing in many of in my bracket and many of other brackets to first, second or third place. Uh -huh. So it kind of, you know, was a victim of, of being of, in a tough ooh, it's scenario. Placement. Yeah. yeah. So let's talk about that just for a second. Um, so this was a single elimination which may, means that this is an excellent way to figure out what your favorite is. It may not be the best way to figure out how to rank these, mm -hmm. because if you had number one and number two that were pitted against one another, it was actually number one and 32, but regardless. So if you have two whiskeys that are pitted against one another and they're both excellent whiskeys, the one that edges it out may knock one out early, mm -hmm. right? But the statistical probability of all five people knocking that out is not as high as if one person had done right. it, right? And, and as we provide aggregate scoring, we'll see in some of the brackets Balance how, some that, of that out. how that might have happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for all of you statisticians out there that want to say like, hey, five people is not statistically relevant, we know that. To go back to my newly coined phrase, don't be a douche nozzle. This is just for funsies, okay? Right. We're not telling people what they're supposed to drink. We're not telling people what they should or should not like. We're just reporting the news. Yep. Okay, so with all that in mind, what was the loser that everybody would be shocked by? Hey there, Bourbon Real Talk listeners and watchers. Randy Sullivan here. Wanted to take a quick break to tell you how you can support the channel. We've had a lot of people that have come into the Bourbon Real Talk family lately, and we're grateful for every one of you. But unlike a lot of other channels, we don't have a Patreon, and I don't allow anyone to sponsor the show. So what I do have, though, is some merchandise. So one of the things that I wanted to show you guys is we have Bourbon Real Talk Glen Karens available for sale on our website. Um, and great news, we actually have some Wee Glens uh, on their way. So we had Wee Glens custom manufactured. They're half the size of a regular Glen, Glen, excellent for tasting. On the website, we also have candles and they're more masculine scents. So this one's like leather. And these candles are manufactured by my daughter's candle company. She wanted to buy her own car, so we helped her start her own business. And she manufactured a line of masculine smelling candles for the Bourbon Real Talk family. The next thing that we have is kind of a little interesting gadget. This is a Glen lanyard. So basically, it goes around your neck like any other lanyard, but it's specifically designed to hold a Glen whiskey glass. And it allows you to go hands-free. So uh, honestly, the first time I saw one of these, I thought it was a silly concept. Then someone gave me one. I used it at a bottle share. It was super efficient, truly 
made it a more enjoyable experience as I interacted with people. Um, we also have these decorative storage boxes for your whiskey samples. So if you get involved in the whiskey community, you're gonna be given samples like this one. And one day you're gonna look up and you got little sample bottles sitting all over the place. It doesn't look that good. And so we manufactured these uh, custom storage boxes. Uh, those are available as well. And the creme de la creme of merch for Bourbon Real Talk is the American Whiskey Aroma Kit. So the story on this is I was doing reviews People kept asking me, how do you learn how to break down the different flavors of a whiskey? And I had learned through a wine aroma kit, but I could not find a bourbon aroma kit that I liked. Uh, most of them came in a cardboard box. The scents didn't always make sense uh, for bourbon. Some of them would say they were for bourbon, but they had scents in there that were really more scotch focused. And so my wife, who helped with the candle company, Help me curate this box. We crowdsourced the 36 cents that went in this through the whiskey community. And I probably went through about 350 different cents to find these 36. Uh, interesting little tidbit, I've given one of these to the master distiller of a major legacy Kentucky distillery. And he reported back that he loves all the scents and that he uses it to train his sensory team uh, but I am not allowed to tell you what the distillery is, uh, or it would probably ruin my relationship with them. So, uh, if you saw any of this stuff, you want to support the channel, you can head on over to bourbonrealtalk.com forward slash shop and pick something up. But if you just want to hang out here and learn, I'm totally happy with that as well. Just happy to have you as a listener. The Loser, nationally recognized, award-winning Angel's Envy. One of the three that ended up with no points. Angel's Envy Port Finished Bourbon. My first real bottle of bourbon. My true love, if I may. Yeah. The one that got me into this nightmare. I was, I was at Whiskey Cake, right? Mm -hmm. and, I, and I had just discovered a, a, a little bit of a love for bourbon and I, I didn't know anything about it. And I went to somebody's birthday party and I asked the server, I was like, what do you guys have that you think would be interesting? And he's like, oh, you have to try this Angel's Envy. I'm not even sure that he told me that it was a port finish. And if he did, I wouldn't have known the difference. I didn't know that bourbon couldn't be port finished and it becomes Classics 41 at that point. I didn't know any of that stuff, mm -hmm. right? And I loved it. And I thought it smelled great. And I went out and I sought out a bottle and I bought it, right? So the, the one market. of my gateway whiskeys. Yeah. Not it, the first bourbon I ever bought, but my first whiskey that I went and sought out when, right. when I decided like, hey, I wanna, I wanna start to explore the variance of flavors between different brands. This is one of the worst, first ones that I, I bought and it didn't do well in this competition. Right, and, and it really set the market for Port Finish. And, when, and they were, they were confident when they brought it to market. I was actually talking to the Angel's Envy rep at a tasting not too long ago, and he said they were doing guaranteed buybacks to the liquor stores to get them to pick it up when they first came to market. Right. And they never had to because the market loved it. So it's tough because grandfather's got a good spot there and recognizing this is the port bourbon off the shelf that's right. ruby. There is also another expression as part of the seller collection that's tawny mm -hmm. that will be in part two of the bracket. Uh, that we'll be working on whenever my brain can unpack what we just learned from this right, whole thing. Right, and the Tani is unobtainium, so, um, <laughs> yeah. Is that distillery only? I think it's distillery. It was an annual distillery only in 2020, early 20. Um, they're supposed to be releasing another finish. It's unconfirmed what it is, so I won't, I won't state it here, but I'm pretty excited about that one as well. Uh, I got a couple bottles, so we'll be able to do it uh, as, a, as part of the part two. Nice. Well, and I will also say for all of you uh, port lovers out there, the port finish lovers, and also for anybody from Angel's Envy, we need to pay homage because Lincoln Henderson, who was a Brown Foreman employee, he came up with this concept of like, let's do what Scotland does and mm -hmm. let's, let's put these whiskeys in barrels that have had other things in them and see if we can develop some more complex flavors and things like that. And 
you know, he, he did it. He, he kind of paved the way. It's not that he's the first person to do it, mm -hmm. but I feel like he's the first person to do it on a large enough scale that it normalized it. And I would venture to guess that most of these bottles that are represented in, in, in this competition wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Angels Envy. I, I have to fully agree. I mean, they really were trailblazers. Maybe not the first, but they were the ones who took the step to, to make, make sure that it was, uh, it was market ready. Okay, so what are some of the other uh, the, shocking results? The next one, I'll, I'll kind of lump this, a couple of these into shocking because, you know, I, I, there's a lot of experiments that are out there that say it's cost to value and cost to perception of, of goodness. Um, I think there's also perception to rarity of that as well and ability to obtain it. There were a few bottles that took an inordinate amount of time and effort for me to acquire. Mm -hmm. And so I had really high hopes for them. So a couple of those that I'll, I'll mention uh, that I would say didn't score as well as the amount of effort it took me to get them. Uh, one of them is Wiggle. Uh, Wiggle ended up in the uh, 24th slot by points aggregated across the five of us. This is a Pennsylvania uh, rye and the Pennsylvania style rye. Aged a pretty good amount of time. I want to say it was over a year. Mm -hmm. It came to me in Texas three times before I finally was able to actually get it okay. from, from a shipping perspective, coming back and forth, back and forth. So a lot of effort, um, had a lot of high hopes for it, was a little disappointed by its final ranking because of that. The next one that took an inordinate amount of effort, and actually, thanks to a member of Someone Say Whiskey I was able to get, was Ironfish. I talked to the distillery. They were super nice, told me the best batch to get and then said, good luck finding it uh, because they, they couldn't help. Yeah, they're sold out, right. Um, so we were able to find it. It wasn't one of their top batches, but it was in their second tier. And a lot of effort ended up getting a member who was in Michigan uh, where Ironfish is, found it, and drove it back uh, to us. So thank you, Mr. Hauser. You know who you are. Uh, and then the next one, I would say, scored high, higher than many might expect for a, a relatively unknown brand but for how long it's been aged, the amount of care, the amount of effort that went into this, I was surprised that it landed at the 12th place mark. And that's Black Button. Black Button is aged over three years in the port barrel. Wow. And you can even, I don't know if this can pick up on camera. It it's, is black. It's black as ink. And, and just so you know, typical uh, port finish aging is probably three to six months, maybe nine would, months. Yeah, I would say under a year is definitely But definitely under a year. So that's an extreme amount of exposure to that port barrel. Yeah, and I on that one, I specifically scored it rather low. It was aggregated through some of the others, but it only got through the first round for me. Right. And so, so if you want to know, like, this was such an interesting thing for me to personally to go through because there's a lot of whiskeys that are represented here that I've never even heard their names. And then there's a lot of whiskeys that I believed myself to be extremely familiar with. And when I sat down to do this, there's so many, there were 32 whiskeys in the bracket. And so you, you think like, oh no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna know which ones my favorites are. I'm gonna be able to identify them. But with 32 to choose from, and, and in all fairness, I, I tried to keep it double blind. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't, you were posting whiskeys that were in the competition one per day um, in, in March. I didn't look at any of those. Oh, wow. Because I, I didn't even want to know what brands were in there. Yeah. I didn't want to be influenced by that. I, I just wanted it to be a completely blind raw opinion and that's what i got and when i got down to the end i had some results that i i felt like were pretty shocking mm -hmm. right i was shocked that i knocked angels envy out in the first round um i was shocked that um i knocked midwinter night's dram out so early mm -hmm. right like Midwinter midwinter night's dram is probably one of the most sought after well-known national and international brands for a port finished whiskey and it finished in fifth place, which is good, but I knocked it out pretty early, I think. Yeah, that one, I say for, for its notoriety, landing in fifth place was, I, I would say, a massive shock. Right. Um, let's go through a, everyone's firsts. Okay. I think that'll be interesting. Oh, that'd be, where, that'd be where everybody landed for their first place because these were aggregated. So my first place mm -hmm. was, you know, actually not too much of a surprise because I've been touting the value of Woodenville well, yeah. on, as, a, as a shelf available, amazing port finished whiskey for 
probably all of 2020. Right, sure. Um, and I, I experienced it because my fa- part of my family is in Seattle. I went to the distillery, found out about it, found it, thought I was bringing the coolest thing home, and then it started to pop up in Texas. So uh, I really wanted people to experience that. So this was my first place. We had two others, uh, three others that aren't here. Uh, Randy, do you want to grab your first? Do you remember what it is? I actually don't. That one is Big Bottom Barlow Trail. This is out of the Pacific Northwest. It's a blend, a small batch. Um, really, really interesting. Kind of uh, not available here, but uh, pretty available on the West Coast of the United States, here being in Texas. And I've never heard of it. <laughs> never heard, never even heard the brand, and I picked it as my favorite port finished of, 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 of all. I mean, now I will admit that when, when I got down to the end and I was down to my final four, it, it, it's, it's a little bit weird because some were bourbons and some were rice and some had like a bolder uh, pot, pot still style flavor to them. Mm-hmm. And some had like a more subdued column still style flavor. And you have to pick, right? Like you don't, you don't get to just go like, oh, I can't call this one, right? You right. have to pick one. So I kind of came up with the rule like, it's, it's, it's supposed to be a finished whiskey. So I'm gonna pick the, if they're equally as good, but one's bolder than the other, I'm gonna pick the bolder one. And what ended up happening is when I got down to the last four, I had two that were more traditional flavored port finish whiskeys. Mm-hmm. And I had two that were like the bigger, bolder flavors. Mm-hmm. And so my wife and I were tasting them together and she and I were picking the same ones. But once we started to get down to the end and we had some bolder flavored whiskeys, she would always pick the lighter flavor one. And, and my kind of MO had been like, well, if you can't pick, pick the bolder one. And so I kind of had an alternate ending, right? Yeah. Because I was like, well, if I had picked, cause I picked a bold one and I was like, no, nah, I need to change that. Right. Because I'm going to end up with this weird finishing where I've got two whiskeys that are completely different from one another. And so I had kind of a bold finish flavored winner and then like the more sub- subdued flavored winner. Um, and the subdued was, was this one, yep. which it's funny to call it subdued because it's a great big flavor, but some of the whiskeys <laughs> were so big. Well, and I think this on your secondary bracket, that's where the starlight came in as the secondary yeah. bourbon for you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there was an interesting note. Somebody, I was remembering they, we had the chat going, we were not telling anybody what our picks were, but it was a way to still stay engaged with, with, sure. the, with the judges. And one of them said, uh Oh, I think I just eliminated midwinners. I said, why do you think that? Uh, he said, I just, I recognized the profile and it, what, it wasn't as good as the one I selected. I said, oh, okay. I didn't tell him. I went back and looked and he was 100% correct. No. He, had, he had eliminated midwinners. And the one that he had selected as the winner, along with one of the other judges, so we had two judges that selected the Traverse City port finish as their number one. And this is what had beat out midwinners for him. And he knew it, that it was midwinners and he had to select this one. Right. It's just and didn't you and I knock this results. one out real early? Very polarizing. This was a super polarizing whiskey. Very polarizing. Like people loved it or they were just like, meh. Yeah, it, it fell flat for me on it. And the good thing is, I don't think anybody would go wrong with any of these. You no, will no. enjoy every single one. Yeah. Uh, but there's just nuances. Everybody has their own thing. For me, I wanted something that you, know, you could come home at the end of the day and just pour it up a glass and you wouldn't have to think about it. And it was just right. delicious. So one of the exciting things for me um, was that Garrison Brothers came in fourth place. Absolutely. Right, because like Garrison Brothers is, can be a polarizing whiskey and people love it or hate it. And it's such a bold flavor, right? Mm-hmm. Super viscous, you know, it's a pot still, it's Texas, it's, it's smaller barrels, tons of oak interaction. Mm-hmm. But I was unable to detect all of that with the port finish added, Mm -hmm. it just tasted like a really good whiskey to me. Yeah. Right. And they aged it in Yano Estacado, Texas port casks. So they made it even more Texas as they finished it in in their port barrels. I did not know that. So very interesting. Do we want to tell them what the number one is? Um, well, uh, well, we had three that got zero points from anyone. We did. We mentioned one was Angel's Envy. The other two, one is Black Ridge. Black Ridge is Total Wines brand. Um, it is rumored to be Sazerac juice, Barton 1792. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you've seen the recent Thomas More, you'll see that in part two. There was some discussion about being this being the experiment of that on the market. Honestly, when I tasted it at Total Wine, 
loved it. Okay. Loved it when I drank it at home. Very few of these did I drink beforehand because I wanted to preserve my memory of it and not say, oh, I, I think that's this. Uh, so I tried to not open anything before we got started. I also didn't want some to oxidize and others not. So sure. I opened them all right. at the exact same time. All fresh cracks when you yep. poured the samples off. Right. Got it. The other one, uh, Kadi out of uh, Washington State had two entries in there. They had a bourbon and a rye. Their rye was also one of the ones that did not receive any points. Their bourbon didn't fare too much better at 28th out of 32. So that, I believe that one only ended up with two points. Wow. So I'm sure we had great things coming out of, out of, out of this distillery. They're in a really interesting position. They're, it feels like there's trying to be more of a single malt category as I look at it and how, mm -hmm. they, how they present themselves, uh, which will have some single malts in part two uh, as well. Uh, American single malts finished in port whiskey, uh, port wine, sorry. Um, and those are the three that, that ended up with, with no points, unfortunately. So let's talk about the, uh, the top five. So number five we've already mentioned is uh, Midwinter Night's Dram. It is. Right? And I think I already mentioned that Garrison number Brothers four was yep. Garrison Brothers. Uh, very well scored across the board. So had, had a really balance of, of, uh, of scores that, that, that were right. represented. Right, that, that was well received, mm -hmm. which, which actually surprised me since that whiskey can be so polarizing. Right, Barton, uh, Big Bottom as well, Barlow Trail was another one that had really high scores of, across, across the, the board. board. Everyone mm -hmm. seemed to like this yep. one, okay. Traverse City was the polarizing one. Because it finished as number one in two of the five brackets, mm -hmm. that catapulted it into second place, which I think is fair if you think and consider the fact that it beat out 31 others sure. across you know, 40 percent of the judges right but the number one also a story of of hard to get new york distillery between highway 5 and highway 20 thus the name 5 and 20 spirits all local they they mash they distill they source everything out of new york 5 and 20 distillery with their rye was the number one on aggregate scoring as well as one of the individuals uh, sheets. So wow. very well represented. We also did a couple of head to heads, uh, tournaments as well. We mentioned, uh, Garrison brothers beating out TX whiskey for their port for Texas port bourbons, mm -hmm. but the bourbons couldn't have all the fun. And we also did Texas rise, uh, for that are port finished. And in that category, we had uh, yellow rose and Milam and green yellow rose be, I'm uh, sorry, Milam and green beat out yellow rose in that category. Uh, for the best of Colorado, interesting. We had Breckenridge mm -hmm. and Laws, both scored right next to each other in the final rankings. They were like two points apart, right? Mm -hmm. But Breckenridge did end up taking the win between the two of them, edging them out. Yep. For best of Michigan, between Traverse City and Ironfish, we obviously had Traverse City with Ironfish uh, kind of being a surprise based on how hard it was to get. Uh, Woodenville clearly as my favorite scored higher than the Kadi bourbon and then for the Pennsylvania's both did not score very well hmm. dad's hat and wiggle uh, maybe it's something to do with the Pennsylvania style rye and how it finished off maybe not uh, kind of meshing too well but both finished very low but dad's hat did take the win between the two I'd be curious to see if there was any correlation between uh for the for the rye rankings um how high the rye content was versus the corn content so, so for, yeah. the, for those of you who don't know there's kind of two styles of rye there's the there's the barely legal rye that's 51 percent rye so it's just it's just over the legal limit to keep it from being a bourbon and then there's the you know maryland style rye or pennsylvania style rye that's a higher rye content typically around 80 percent but some 95 some even a hundred percent and so you know that that could have we might be able to figure out that uh super high rye content doesn't do well with port right i yeah. don't know and I, I you know we've got the someone say whiskey website that's coming up so we'll put all the results uh, all the data uh, out there for for you all to look at mm -hmm. um, you'll also be able to see all the contestants who are involved in port one uh, part one excuse me i got port on the mind port on the mind what would be interesting is if you know of a of a port finished whiskey that isn't represented here we have 25 of the next 32 in the next part two bracket already identified and sourced 
drop a, drop a comment below. Let us know if there's one that isn't represented. We'll chase it down if it's not already on our list so we make sure we can, uh, we can get it included. After we have the top, we're gonna do a champion's bracket. Okay. That is where we will determine the number one in America. We'll send them a nice little plastic trophy so they know how much love we have for their amazing expression. I love it, that is amazing. So this is just for funsies. I got to be a taster, it was great. Super fun experience. A um, lot of time, energy, and effort went into sourcing all of these bottles. And, you know, I, I feel like people are starting to become more open to, you know, finished American whiskey. And this might be useful information for people. So hopefully we'll be able to get, you know, the second round done and then the, the I, I don't like calling it the, the champions, but like I, I want to call it like the playoffs, right? Like <laughs> yeah. it's like, it's like the playoffs. All of these people have won all throughout the season. So yep. now it's time to see who the real champion is. Mm -hmm. So all of that is coming. We'll film for that as well. If you want more information about Bourbon Real Talk, you can get that at bourbonrealtalk.com. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube forward slash Bourbon Real Talk. Um, love feedback. So if you want to throw a comment below, I'd uh, love it if you'd subscribe, like, review, and comment. All of that helps. And I want to share with you the show philosophy because you may be watching this show for the very first time. And my show philosophy is about bringing people together. And what I've learned is that, like it or not, brown spirits are not meant to be drank alone, okay? They bring people together. Psychologically, it's a communal resource that you're supposed to share. And sadly, I did lose a family member to suicide in 2014. And that loss came as a shock to me, you know, and it, it, it woke me up. It made me realize there's people all around us that they feel alone. They, they, they don't know that they're loved. They don't feel connected. And I saw the connective power of whiskey and I wanted to do something about it. And that's part of the impetus for starting this channel. So this channel's philosophy is about using the connective power of whiskey to bring people together. And I've seen a lot, especially lately on the internet of division and people showing hate to one another that don't even know each other. They never even met. And I figure if someone can hate you that's never met you, it's just as easy for me to love you. And so that's why I sign off every show with the same sign off and that is, if you woke up this morning and you were unsure whether or not anyone loved you, just know that I love you, and I'll see you next time on Bourbon Real Talk. Cheers.